Record of Ragnarok is the very definition of a cult hit. A manga that has received niche success, but within that niche, such a loyal following that the comment sections of videos pertaining to Record of Ragnarok feel like fights to the death over who would win rivaling that of the brutality of Ragnarok itself. So of course, in December 2020, when Netflix announced that it would be licensing an anime adaptation for the summer release, the world over shook from the upcoming Battle of the Gods set to shake their televisions, right? Uh, no, it was not very good. There are multiple fight scenes throughout the anime that are little more than still images, and even when there's not, there's nothing really impressive to say the least. The number of fluid Sakuga scenes are nearly zero, and frankly, nothing about the visuals gets you excited to see these gods and legends duke it out. There are already a dozen videos out there critiquing the animation in depth, so in this video, I want to examine how exactly this happened, rather than just repeat what has already been said. Now, the internet has clearly overreacted, calling it a total slideshow, but it's undeniable that the end product of the anime is certainly below average. However, the primary reason there is so much controversy over the less than stellar animation has to do with the source material itself, because it's literally nothing but fights. Records of Rag Ragnarok is collaboratively written by Shinya Umamura and Takumi Fukai, the former of which has published two somewhat successful manga, Chiyoren and Tensho no Ryuma. As a quick aside, this isn't the first time that Umamura has had their work violated by a poor adaptation. Here's what the artwork looks like for Chiyoren, and the only anime that it ended up receiving was this spin-off. All things considered, at least Records of Ragnarok actually got a mainline adaptation. On the other side, Yakumi Fukai also holds a fairly impressive resume of previous works, most notably Cerberus, also a manga based in Greek mythology. However, the star of the show is Ajichika, the goat behind Ragnarok's visual spectacle. Or should I say goats, as Ajichika is actually the pen name of a four-person mangaka group. The talent of four is certainly needed here, as Record of Ragnarok is about legendary humans and gods fighting it out tournament style to determine the fate of the human race. And that's literally it. This is why such a misstep in animation is so damning for Record of Ragnarok, as it's fighting, fighting, and more fighting. There are various gags and side stories thrown throughout the chapters, however they are almost all served to build up hype for new warriors or create excitement for an upcoming bout. Essentially, Ragnarok is WWE if it took place in Valhalla, and we all go extinct if our side loses. Once the fight starts, nearly every other page is a full spread demonstration of the full power and brutality of these great fighters. Ajichika's talent for the human form nearly matches the likes of Yusuke Murata and Itagaki in terms of their ability to convey each movement so clearly and patiently. So to reduce something like this to this, something somewhere must have gone wrong, and the first place to look is in the animation studio, Graf Nanika. Now unless you've already been plugged deep into the drama of Record of Ragnarok, it's very unlikely that you have any idea what this studio is that I just mentioned. And I wouldn't blame you in the slightest. They don't really have a stellar portfolio of animation, and the only project which you've likely heard of is the Helsing Ultimate OVA series. They also produced the original film Expelled from Paradise, which I personally very much enjoyed, but it doesn't have the great reputation in the greater community. The company was founded in 2009 from former Gonzo employees, but didn't get their start until 2012 when Helsing Ultimate was created, which, again, was a simply incredible adaptation, mostly thanks to the experienced talent such as director Hiroyuki Tanaka of Guilty Crown and Claymore Acumen, as well as animation director and key animator Masahiko Kamino, who has done key animation for, well, everything. So then, what of Record of Ragnarok? Well, the director Okubo Masao does have directing experience on pre-par of the movie. Okay, sorry, I'll be fair. He also has episode direction for Jewel Pet, Mahasuke Tai, Onigai My Melody, and I'll stop now. This anime was not exactly given the star-studded treatment. Now, look, we need to make something extremely clear here. Studio Graf Nanika, as well as the staff on the project, have done nothing wrong. As far as I can tell, there were some talented key animators on this project, but only a small number have actually been credited. However, at the end of the day, something that a lot of people tend to forget here is that most animators are actually paid by the frame, with notable exceptions being the salary-funded animators over at Kyoto Animations. If Netflix or Warner Brothers paid Graf Nanika a certain amount of money to make Record of Ragnarok, then Netflix is going to get exactly the number of frames that they paid for. No more, 
no less. Additionally, it's not like the inexperience of Studio Graft and Nika is some closely guarded secret. To task them with such a difficult project, one based almost entirely in fight scenes and high octane actions is a big ask indeed. In fact, the team over at Graft and Nika admitted in interviews that they themselves were not up for the task. Now, there are some rumors going around that they were only given two months to animate the project, but the only major staff interview posted by Warner Brothers Japan mentions nothing of the sort, so I don't believe this to be true. The truth is that animation is really hard, and no animator goes into a project wanting to do a bad job. I learned that myself when I made my Dawn to Dawn video, where I decided I wanted to include animated manga panels. With the help of this video sponsor Skillshare and their Adobe After Effects class by Mana and Luart, I was able to improve leaps and bounds, and I can't wait to integrate more scenes like this into my videos. If you've never done something like it before, it can feel daunting, but honestly, it feels like a superpower once you've discovered how to do it. What's better is that you can take that superpower and use it on your own illustrations. And Skillshare has tons of fantastic resources to get you started. Whether you're a dabbler or a pro, a hobbyist or a master, you're creative. Discovered what you can make with classes for every skill level. Skillshare is curated specially for learning, meaning there are no ads, they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Okay, so we've established that nobody is trying to animate poorly, and Graf Nanika said themselves that they were in over their head from the project that they were given. So then the blame rests with Netflix and Warner Brothers, right? Well, if you're going to put the blame on the producer or the investors, then we need to answer a pretty simple question. Is Record of Ragnarok a popular enough series to actually warrant a large budget? Let's go over the accolades. First, sales. Record of Ragnarok has amassed 7 million copies sold. Now, compared to your mainline Shonen Jump series, this may not seem like much, but for a manga printed in a magazine you definitely have never heard of, it really isn't that bad. In fact, with 11 volumes, this is about 640,000 copies per volume on average. To put that into perspective, Black Clover has sold around 15 million copies after 28 volumes, which comes to 535,000 copies per volume. Now, now, Black Clover is actually a relatively slow selling series compared to the amount of time it's been in the magazine, but that number is still respectful in the grand scheme of things. The fact that Record of Ragnarok outsells it and reach that number without an anime is pretty indicative of its financial success. Okay, so then, what about its straight popularity? Golgo 13 sells hundreds of millions of copies and nobody really talks about it, right? Well, in 2019, Ragnarok was ranked fifth for manga for male readers by Kono Manga no Sugoi. And in 2020, placed 12th overall in nationwide bookstore employees recommended comics. So clearly, the retailers saw it flying off the shelves. At this point, then, we're really just left scratching our heads, wondering if Warner Brothers and Netflix were so incompetent that they would have let such a cash cow go to a studio that more or less admitted that they couldn't handle it. However, this is where I give my own personal take. Although Record of Ragnarok is extremely successful in terms of raw sales, this doesn't always translate well to how well it's going to be received by the general public. Ragnarok is a series built around building tremendous hype around singular fights. Where typical battle-based anime have quote-unquote final bosses, your pains, your overhauls, your doflamingos, most fights are relatively inconsequential. Yeah, they need to be fought, but their existence pretty much just justifies themselves. However, in Ragnarok, every fight matters. When one side has won seven battles, Ragnarok is complete and humanity either lives or perishes. The public likes to be kept on their seat week to week, and each airing episode feeling like it's building to a reveal or big event. Ragnarok, while every punch matters, doesn't really have this sort of appeal built in. And with online, full season delivery, maybe even less so. But that's just pure speculation. What's less speculation is Netflix's business model. It's hard to say who's the chicken and who's the egg here, but it's likely that the two companies certainly collaborated with Netflix in mind. Even though the anime audience is growing, it's still a very niche group within the platform's overall all subscriber base, and Netflix boasts an extremely low churn rate, and it achieves this by guaranteeing a constant stream of new, exclusive content. When golden eggs such as House of Cards, Queen's Gambit, and yes, even Castlevania exist, Netflix doesn't really need to have very much to keep you on Netflix. Mostly, it needs regular, store-bought, food lion eggs, such as, well... <sighs> 
Records of Ragnarok. Netflix could have taken a relatively successful manga that would have required an absurd animation budget to satisfy its fans and given it the UFO tobble or wit treatment. Or it could have just been another thing for Netflix to simply say is theirs. Even though it feels like Netflix has an endless money tree, dumping the cash needed to make the legendary anime that Record of Ragnarok deserves would have been risky. Whereas normal TV needs to have you in your seat for that particular episode, streaming content it into your peepers to be successful, Netflix really only needs the assurance of new content to keep you subscribed. As angry as most of us are about Ragnarok, I bet very few of us actually cancelled our Netflix subs as a result, and that's exactly what they were expecting. I'm not making excuses. In a perfect world, Warner Brothers and Netflix would have chosen any other mid-range selling battle manga to give the PowerPoint treatment. Warner Brothers and Netflix have not won any points from me, but I also don't necessarily blame them for not immediately seeing the brilliance of Ragnarok that most of us saw. So that's a little anticlimactic, right? No boogeyman, no conspiracy, no singular person to pin the crime onto like the Zero Requiem. Well, that's just how things go. In the real world, there are hundreds if not thousands of different people involved in the anime creation process. Each of them have their own goals and interests, and sometimes those interests don't necessarily align with us, the most hardcore of fans. This will happen again, and it might just happen to a series you really wanted to be adapted well. However, at the end of the day, the series will still exist in its original form. The manga doesn't go away just because the anime is bad, and for every bad adaptation, a better one will take its place. That's all for this video, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.